Bases dropped on another round of soccer down here and wasting no time this morning. Let's do this. Luis Rubiales banned from football for three years over Jenny Herm- over the kiss with uh, Jenny Hermoso. From Susie Rack at The Guardian, banned from all football-related activities for three years following a FIFA disciplinary committee investigation into his conduct at the Women's World Cup final. Morning, Abby. Belated birthday, Alex. Morning. Former president of the Spanish Football Federation got a 90-day suspension six days after the final during which he planted the kiss on Hermoso during the medal ceremony, an act she says was not consensual, and he claims it was. Ruby Ellis was also seen grabbing his crotch in celebration, carrying uh, Athenea del Castillo over his shoulder following a historic World Cup win. Initially refused to resign from his post, insisting at an extraordinary general assembly or called to, that was called to address the issues that he was the victim of a witch hunt and would not be stepping down. However, on the 10th of September, four days after Jorge Vilda, the coach and staunch ally of Rubiales, backed by the president at the General Assembly, offered a new half a million euro a year deal. He was let go four days after that. Rubiales finally resigned Monday, earlier today. FIFA announced Rubiales had been found to have breached Article 13 of the FIFA Disciplinary Code, which relates to offensive behavior and violations of the principles of fair play, and was handed the three-year ban. Quote, this case relates to the events that occurred during the final of the Women's World Cup on 20 August, for which Mr. Rubiales had been provisionally suspended for an initial period of 90 days. Notified of the terms of the FIFA Disciplinary Committee decision today, in accordance with the relevant provisions of the FIFA Disciplinary Code, he has 10 days in which to request a motivated decision, which, if requested, would subsequently be published on FIFA's website. The decision remains subject to a possible appeal before the FIFA Appeal Committee. High Court in Spain had been examining the case. After prosecutors cited concerns there could be grounds to charge Rubiales with sexual assault as well as coercion over the kiss, in a statement on the 25th of August, uh, Ormosa said the incident left her feeling, quote, vulnerable and a victim of aggression. Characterized the kiss as an impulsive act, sexist, out of place, and without any type of consent from my part, end quote. Rubiales vowed to defend his innocence in a lengthy statement published last month, added, I have faith in the truth and will do everything in my power so that it prevails. Susie Rat goes on uh, at The Guardian to say that for more than a decade, Spanish players have raised concerns about the culture and conditions around the women's national team. Concerns either ig- uh, concerns ignored. Players faced retaliation for speaking out. 2011, they complained to the Fed. After finishing bottom of the group in 2015, the entire team called for the resignation of the manager at the time and an improvement in training and facilities. Manager at the time, Ignacio Quereda, was sacked. Vilda was hired. Senior players phased out of the squad. And there you go. Nothing like starting off the morning with breaking news involving Luis Urbialis. It will be interesting to see if he decides he wants to appeal. So you have the extraordinary General Assembly. And what was it? What was what did they phrase it as? It was uh notified the decision. What was it? Uh Motivated decisions. So we have motivated decisions and we have uh, extraordinary general assemblies. So that's where we are. But Ruri Alice is, has been uh, banned from football for three years by FIFA for the kiss on Ginny Hermoso. About blanking time. So there you go. Uh, morning, everybody. I know it's like this happened, I want to say like uh, 90 minutes ago. And so obviously we had to start the show with that. It kind of took the, it took the rundown and put it in the blender. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Apparently Alex's birthday is today. I jumped the gun. So that's what I get for looking on social media. Uh, Alex says it's uh, Alex Merodana and Sean Longstaff, elite footballers born on this day. Bam, morning, evening. Uh, Bam, keeping an eye on the A-League for us. 28 goals in six matches. Greatest league in the world. 
Yeah, we are going to be spending a lot of time with uh, what happened in Major League Soccer over the weekend. And especially what happened last night where you had goals scored. But that's not quite opening kickoff. Uh, opening kickoff is brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee and uh, kickoffcoffeeco.com. Let me see if I can get my hand to cover things. There we go. See, this is what happens when you're left-handed and the mouse is on one side. That's the QR code for those of you who are watching on Twitch, the 280 character app and on the YouTube channel. We've gone live on the YouTube channel now as well. And then uh, for our friends at Kickoff Coffee, Thanks for everything that they do. Don't forget to use the code soccer down here 15. You get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Now I can uh, uncover both QR codes because one QR codes for hour number two and kind of, I, you know, having to kind of cross over everything and figure out how to uh, get everything where. I'm not confusing machines and confusing QR codes and all this kind of stuff. So there were a lot of exciting endings this weekend. And it wasn't just in, you know, it wasn't just in the leagues that we kind of follow on a, on a regular basis. Did you know that a league championship was decided on an Olympico? Happened in the CPL. Like I said, this is opening kickoff, so it's kind of all over the place. <laughs> I, Abby, I have to be, I would have to be here. Um, thank you for offering. Uh, CPL final with uh, with the Forge from uh, Hamilton, Ontario, eventually repeating. Took uh, more than 90 minutes. Had to go the extra 30. But. No goals had been scored in the first 100 minutes, and they get three in the final 20. This was the one that decided it, courtesy of our friends at One Soccer, and nothing like having an Olympico decide a championship. Here's how it was called on One Soccer, north of the border in onesoccer.ca. Burgess, a player known for his moments of the extraordinary from the corner flag. Service and goals. Borges tries to run back. Tristan Borges and Olympico in extra time. Are you kidding me? I've never seen that before in a championship final. <laughs> that was a spectacular finish. He whipped it in. At pace, the power, accuracy. What a finish that was. Again, look, nobody's at the back post. Carducci scrambling. Can't get his hands on it. And Trapper, the exact same. That's why it's always important at times to have somebody on that near and far post for those situations. But for Borges to see it, nobody's at that back stick. And with his quality, just... So you end up with that finishing up the match where Forge gets a championship. And it's not the first time, apparently, that Tristan Borges has done Olympico. He actually did it in competition in 2019. But this one was a little bit more important. So Forge knocks off Cavalry. Scores it in the 111th minute. So three goals basically in 20 minutes. And Forge hangs on for the CPL championship. And Olympico. So Tristan Borges gets the win. Forge uh, gets another championship. Bobby Smyrniotis, by the way. I honestly thought that Bobby Smyrniotis was going to be the new head coach for Toronto FC. But Smyrniotis has done some amazing work there in the, the years that he has been at Forge. But, yeah, any time that you get an Olympico to uh, decide a championship, that's going to make the show. Not to be outdone. Well, actually, I think, honestly, the Olympico is better than this particular moment. But uh, 
in League One. We've got a championship matchup, and it is Charlotte Independence and North Carolina FC. So you had a bit of an upset on the left-hand side of the bracket where Charlotte traveled to Warner Park and Pappy on Nebraska. They go to PK's, and this is how it was decided in the bottom of the fifth, courtesy of our friends at ESPN Plus and USL League One and YouTube. With Charlotte Independence to send Charlotte to the USL League One final. The Jacks will ride on to the final as they have upset the top-seeded Union Omaha. What an upset for the Charlotte Independents. They've come on the road and they have taken down the record holders. So you end up with Charlotte winning on the road, North Carolina uh, beating Northern Colorado Hailstorm at home. So you end up with now a final at Wake Med. And uh, we'll cover that this week. Obviously, the USL League One show will be tomorrow. USL Championship show tomorrow. There was some exciting stuff that went on in USL Championship. We'll get into that a little later on in the show. Wasn't quite opening kickoff material. But it was pretty good. So, USL Championship show tomorrow. And I guess I should go over the traffic, shouldn't I? Uh, USL Championship show tomorrow. USL League One show tomorrow. We get a visit from our friends tomorrow at 10 o'clock from Soccer in the Streets. They're going to promote the footy ball for us. So, we're going to uh, find out everything we need to know about footy ball from Soccer in the Streets. With that coming up this weekend, that'll be a part of the Tuesday program. Obviously, Atlanta United getting ready for Columbus. We'll be talking about that. We've got games tonight. We'll do a bit of a whip around later on in the show where we'll go over that in addition to everything else that uh, went on in Major League Soccer. That'll be coming up in just a little bit. Wednesday, hopefully, Dylan Butler, the busiest man in media in Northeast, can join us. Bart can join us. We had two friendlies with the U.S. Women's National Team, a couple of uh, first-time goal scorers in the 3 nil. Uh, second time that you're facing Columbia. No, uh, uh, no Linda Caicedo in the second matchup, but uh, USL, uh, US, uh, WNT, we'll talk about that. There's some refing down here we've got to get into, especially with what happened with Burnley and Bournemouth, and a moment that we'll talk about in Major League Soccer coming up in uh, just a little bit. So that's Wednesday, Thursday is Nico Moreno coming on at 1030. Friday it is... Uh, we can whip around patent pending trademark coming Thursday. Obviously, we'll have our uh, recap of everything that went on in, in leg number one in Columbus with Atlanta United and Columbus crew. That'll be the last matchup of the opening games in the best of threes. Only took them, what, a week? So, yeah, but like I said, I understand it. I get it. I know why you're doing it. Trust me, I get it. So we'll talk about Atlanta United on Wednesday, leading into it on Thursday. We'll recap it all. Friday, hopefully our friends from Beyond Goals Mentoring will get you ready for the weekend and a bunch of other things. So that is the basic traffic for the week. Uh, We will have, uh, we'll catch up with uh, our friends from Greenville Triumph. That'll be midweek, if my math is correct. So uh, conversations, we'll have our 1v1s, all the postmortems for the teams that have been eliminated here in the footprint. We'll catch up with soccer in the Southeast with front office folks and coaches and things like that. But Gringle Triumph next on the clock. Hopefully we'll catch up with our friends from Chattanooga and the Red Wolves as well later on in the week. So that's your weekly traffic. And there we go. So it's going to be a busy week. Just when you thought it wasn't going to be busy, it's going to be busy. So uh, that's opening kickoff. Olympicos and, and last minute finishes. Your opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Kickoffcoffeeco.com. There's your QR code for those who are watching on the 280 character app, the YouTube channel, and on Twitch. Thanks for hanging out with us, by the way. And uh, you get to use the code soccer down here 15. You get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10% reinvested into youth games and youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee. 
and at kickoffcoffeeco.com. All right, Major League Soccer. Uh, so what did you guys think of the weekend? It was crazy. Had its moments. And I guess we can go backward and, and look at what happened. Uh, with the with the schedule, it, it was chalk. It was, you know, it for the most part, it I mean, it was chalk. And I know that uh, Shooter and Rich are probably having discussions with one another. And if we go backward, the only team that was a higher seed that got bit was uh, all caps. And uh, all caps took it on the chin last night. Sporting Kansas City coming in on short rest after playing the 8-9 in the midweek. Advance for your interstate derby, and you end up with a 4-1 result. 4-1. And a lot of that stuff was from distance. Ndembe scored in the 27th minute, and... uh, I don't know which version you might have been watching. It could have been the FS1 version or it could have been the Apple TV version. But Kansas City scores in the 27th minute. Then Tim Parker wastes no time for your equalizer. You're tied at one after 28. Remy Voltaire comes in eight minutes later, makes it 2-1. Gotti Kinda scores three goals in 12 minutes. You go from... No score to being up 3-1. Then Daniel Shallowy scores with 30 to go. 4-1 final. Kansas City is loving the format, and I think probably all caps is loving the format too with uh, the idea that now that they've got to at least have the opportunity to come back in the opening round, but they've got to do it on the road at Children's Mercy Park, and it's a chance for... It's a chance for uh, your first number one to get knocked out in the uh, new playoff format. So big win for Kansas City. St. Louis on the ropes, but under normal circumstances before this season, we would have been sitting there saying, you know what? That was a great upset. That was a great upset. But now you end up with the chance for all caps to come out of it, but it's got to be a two out of three, and they got to win the next two. So I think this was probably what you were looking at if you were a television executive saying, you know what, we should probably do two out of three. We'll see what happens. So uh, all caps, benefactor or victim or both when it comes to the new playoff format. Cincinnati had uh, no problem with Red Bulls. I don't know what Carlos Cornell was thinking. I really don't. Well, actually, I do. But uh, Buddy All scores in the 23rd, and it's 1-0. It's a great short. I mean, it was a, it was an acute angle as a Cornell had the near post covered, and Buddy All goes over his left shoulder and puts it in the back of the net to make it 1-0. Then, you know, it's a ball that Cornell gets to first. He got to it first. But as he launched it back towards center circle, he launched it right at Lucho Acosta. And so Acosta, obviously seeing Carlos Cornell off his line, he's going to send it right back to where it came from, puts enough, uh, puts enough juice on it, but not, you know, he does, it's the three bears routine where you sit there and you like, you bounce it in, you put enough on it and it uh, gets on target. It's two. And then you're wondering if Red Bull are just going to sit there and try to be physical and remind Cincinnati that they're going back to Red Bull Arena for match number two in this opening round playoff series. And this is our first element of what was he thinking? And I mean the center ref. Uh, Rubio Vasquez was in his second playoff match where he was the man in the middle there was an incident that happened between Sean Nealis and Dominic Baji and 
it ends and, and we know that Red Bull are going to be physical and they're going to be chippy and they're going to try to, you know, force you into doing things that they're going to force you into rash decisions and cards, et cetera, et cetera. So late first half, the 45 plus, Dominic Baji and Sean Nealis, they, they get into the pushy shovey and, and they're, you know, taking umbrage and issue with one another. It gets to the point where Dominic Baji has had enough and literally punches Neelis in the sternum. Literally punches him in the sternum. I mean, and it wasn't, it literally was one of those where, you know, they're pushing, and Baji literally takes his right hand after, you know, one of those where you push and you sit there and you, you know, take the opponent's hands and you kind of push the opponent's hands away. Baji literally takes his right hand Punches Neelis in the sternum, and, and you're thinking, okay, all right, I get it. Dude's mad. He went too far. Apparently, he didn't. Because Dominic Baji did not get as much as a card. He didn't get a yellow. Should have gotten a red for a straight punch. But nah. Nope. Nothing. I don't know if there's going to be anything retroactive. Yeah, Wiley should have been a straight red. Yeah, and Abby, there were. There were a few things going on. There was pushing and shoving and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, Neelis was over the top of Baji, and he's pushing him, pushing him back down on the ground, all that kind of stuff. You know, stuff that Red Bull do to try to get you off your game. It's stuff that we've seen before. Nothing, nothing new. But. Nilos and Baji, they're going after each other. And sure enough, Dominic Baji, with the two of them staring right at each other, Baji, after pushing and, and moving hands away, takes his right and goes straight to the sternum. That, to me, is a straight red card. Other than the fact that you're trying to go 15 rounds with Joe Palooka. I mean, takes his right hand. I'm left-handed, so. But takes his right hand, literally punches Nilos in the sternum. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, and Abby, I would I would have given Neelis a yellow. I would have too. But a straight punch to the sternum. Nothing from Dominic Baji at all. Once again, Rubio Vasquez only the second time in his career that he was the man in the middle in the playoff. So when you look at the stats, and we went over statistics and such. I'm trying to see. Fouls. 37 fouls called. 37. 37 fouls called. But that's what, you know, if Red Bulls get their way, especially as they're trailing and such, that's, that's what they're going to want. They're going to want to bog the game down. They're going to want to sit there and try to drag you into their way of playing. 37 fouls, 1918, literally 19 for Cincinnati, 18 for Red Bulls, 37 fouls, 1918, five yellows, five yellow cards, and it only affects you in the next round if you get three yellows, like if you get one in each match. It only affects you then. But 37 fouls called. Vasquez, by nature, I think he's in the mid-20s. But sure, 37 fouls called. 19 for Cincinnati, 18 for Red Bulls. No no card, not even, like I said, nothing on Neelis, nothing on Baji, no red on Baji for the punch. Nothing. But, you know, you figured that uh, Red Bulls might want to try to, as, as they're trailing, they might want to drag Cincinnati down with them. They tried. So we'll see what happens in match number two there. Once again, going backwards. Uh, after the first round, yeah, they are. I'll go back and look, but it, my understanding is the only way that you are suspended for the next round is if you end up with three, one in each match. 
one in each match, then you're penalized if your team advances to this to the next round. Yee. Before that one, Houston and Salt Lake. Good for Houston. Good for Houston at hell in a shell. They fought they fought the weather. They fought a bunch of things. But the four or five ended up being what the four or five we anticipated it was going to be. Houston and Salt Lake going at each other. And I think uh, I think it was mentioned that Ben Olsen mentioned playoff Franco Escobar. Something that uh, Atlanta United fans know a lot about. Ache Ache with a goal in the 22nd. Diego Luna with one in the 54th. And then Bossy off a rebound inside the area with 11 to go. Great 4-5 with Houston and Salt Lake, which is what we figured. But great win for Houston. Ben Olsen being disrespected nationally in the Coach of the Year awards, surroundings, votes, recognition, what have you. Ben Olsen, should he have been the Coach of the Year? Probably not. Should he have been in the consideration for top three? Absolutely. I know a lot of folks are going to sit there and they're going to look at Pat Noonan. I know a lot of folks are going to sit there and and look at – um. Who is it? I just had a brain lock. Um, Carnell from all caps. Ben Olsen should have been number three. Taking that team from where they were, turning them around, getting them to a four in the first round, getting home field advantage in the first round of the MLS Cup playoffs against a pesky, tough, nasty opponent i mean just the kind of i i wouldn't want salt lake in an opening round best of three i really wouldn't houston gets them at home for two of the three it's a four or five it fits but ben olsen should have been number three in coach of the year voting that's me yes noonan yes carnell i get it but ben olsen should have been number three ahead of wilford nancy And I will continue to put my hand over my heart and my other hand in the air on that one. Ben has had to work with a more difficult situation. Nazi had talent coming in. They have to adjust to what Wilford Nazi wants to do. Ben Olsen has had to basically reconstruct the Houston roster. Got them to a four. Got them to home field advantage in the opening round of the playoffs. Ben Olsen should have been number three in the discussion. Houston has a one game advantage. LAFC in Vancouver was just flat out drunk late Saturday night. It was MLS after dark. Vancouver had LAFC's number as we had been talking about. And it was, you know, it, you don't know legitimately in BAM. I know that you're, it's late at night for you, but there are times, especially after, League's Cup after, you know, CONCACAF Champions League specifically. You don't know which LAFC team you're going to get. Are you going to get the ones that are are the world beaters and and can put up, you know, seven goals in eight minutes? Or are you going to get the one that kind of stumbles over their feet and falls down the stairs? You got both in this opening matchup with Vancouver. Ryan Hollingshead scores in the 18th. White scores in the 27th. Denny Buanga comes back and scores the first in his of his brace two minutes later. So it's 2-1 at that point. Sam Adekubi scores for Vancouver to make it 2-2, and that was the score at the break. Hollingshead scores early second half. Denny Buanga scores. 4-2. Mario scores with 10 to go and make it 5-2. You got both LAFCs in this game against Vancouver in game one of this series. We were, let's see. So in this series, 
full disclosure, I was in Auburn with the boss watching uh, an average SEC football team and a below average SEC football team play Saturday afternoon. Driving home, listen to this match. Got home, it was 2 2. Literally emptied out the car because of, you know, packing for tailgating and stuff. Got inside, turned the game on, and it was 4-2. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this is over. Bang. All right. So once again, you've got both LAFCs here. It'll be interesting to see, game two, how they respond to BC Place. Because BC Place is, it is a black hole of energy and logic and everything for the visitors when they come to town. Vanny Sartini and and Vancouver have turned it into a very, very special place that is a pain in the ass for a visitor coming because it's border crossing, it's customs, it's Vancouver. You feel like you're at the end of the planet. You're kind of at the end of the continent. So how does LAFC respond? We'll see. But they end up putting five on the board. At the end of the day, it just means you have a one-game advantage. Then, the first match that Shooter has been talking about for 30 minutes. Philadelphia and New England. The early match on Saturday. Gazdog with a PK. Ua and Nathan Harriel made it 3-0 at the break. Gustavo Bo scores with about 20 to go to make it 3-1. That was your final. We'll get into it in just a second. Possession. Philly thinks the ball has cooties. They don't want it. 46% for them, 54 for New England. 18 shots for Philly, 14 for New England. Four shots on target for Philly, six for New England. Saves and clearances, 15 fouls to 11. 15 fouls for Philly, 11 for New England, 26 called total. But, and this is where Shooter has been uh, going this morning. Four, okay, so here's your numbers. 15 fouls for Philly, 11 for New England. What do you think that the yellow, for those of you that didn't watch and didn't look at statistics, what do you think the yellow card distribution was in this game? Shooter, don't help. Four yellow cards on 11 fouls for New England. Four yellows on 11 fouls. One yellow on 15 fouls for Philly. One on 15, four on 11. Those were your numbers in the game. And now, New England, as they get ready for match number two in this series, you don't know the health of one of your star players because of a hip toss, knee-to-knee contact, stepping into it, however you want to phrase it. New England has to figure out how they might have to navigate game number two in this series without Carlos Heel. I don't believe, I don't remember there being a foul called on the heel contact. And I know there certainly was not a card. But once again, we mentioned it on Friday. Pierre-Luc Lozier. had not been a man in the middle in a postseason environment. First time ever that he was center ref in the MLS postseason. And what do you do? You put him in Philadelphia, New England. You put him in a 4-5. Lozier averaged going into this match 3.06 yellows 
in matches that he was center ref in the regular season. You put him in Philadelphia and New England. He went above his normal average by two, giving five yellows as opposed to his 3.06. But once again, we mentioned this with Rubiel Vasquez, where Vasquez was only in his second in 92, I think it was 92 playoff appearances for Rubiel Vasquez as a as an official. It's only his second is a center ref. Lozier, who was in the middle for Philadelphia, New England. For your debut as a center ref in MLS postseason, we're going to give you Philadelphia, New England, and you don't give a whole lot of yellow cards to begin with. Made the point on Friday. I'll make it again today. If you are Philadelphia and you play the way that you do, and I know, Shooter, I'm probably going to get you riled up all over again, and I apologize. If you are Philadelphia or a team playing Philadelphia and you look at the center ref assignment, first time ever MLS postseason, he only calls, what was it, 21, 22 fouls on average? Called 26, so slightly above average. Gives 3.06 yellow cards. If I'm Philadelphia, that to me is a green light to do what it is I do. And it's even more of a green light than it is traditionally with anybody else that could be assigned by Major League Soccer by pro. So once again, you have a situation where I don't believe pro read the room. You need to, if you are pro in this series, you need to have a hard ass in the middle. You need, I mean, honestly, you need somebody like Ismail Elfath, who has been in international competitions. He's been in the world competition. He knows what uh, that is all about. He knows it's important, knows it's, knows it's importance. But what do you do in match one of a best of three with a team that is very physical and will find the limit when it comes to what they can get away with, when it comes to physicality, when it comes to all the other elements that are attached to it. You're going to try and find out where that line is with this guy. You're going to go right up to it. Then you're going to find somebody else to go right up to it. Then you're going to find somebody else to go right up to it. And you're going to you're going to have each and every individual figure out where that line is when it comes to defense. And also when it comes to trying to draw fouls from the opposition. I probably need to go back and watch Philadelphia and New England just to sit there and see what the situations were when Lozier felt compelled to brandish his yellow card. But one foul or one yellow and 15 fouls for Philly. Four yellows and 11 fouls for New England. And what do you want to bet? What do you want to bet? How much of this, how much of those yellows? For New England, were in retaliation, especially after the injury that was uh, on the field to Carlos Heel. Though, obviously, we don't have an injury update from Clint P.A. or anybody up in New England yet. But once again, Pro fails to read the room. For a 4-5, for something like that, legitimately... <clears throat> I would put Lozier, if Lozier is on your short list, put him in a 1-8. Put him in a 2-7. Don't put him in an evenly matched series out of the blocks. For your first assignment, for your first assignment in MLS postseason, we're going to give you a 4-5. Against a team that's very, very physical. With a team that's very, very physical. 
And so Lazier does what he does. Like I said, he actually gave more yellows than traditionally he does on average. But I want to know how many of those were in retaliation on the New England side. Genuinely curious. So that is how it looks after round one in uh, MLS Cup playoff action. Show of hands, how many of your opinions have changed about the uh, format? You still want it to go back to one and done? You dig the best of three? If your opinion is, okay, I wanted, I wanted it to be two legs aggregate? Did your opinions change after the weekend? Or were you maintained? Did what you saw, did what you see? With what you saw on the weekend, did your opinion change or did was it uh, magnified and amplified when it came to your thoughts on the playoffs, let me know. Twitch pitch. <clears throat> so that's your your MLS Cup playoffs for the weekend. Today, as we start a new week, two matches tonight. And it is the cross-section. Of Orlando, Nashville, Seattle, and Dallas, 7 o'clock, Apple TV, and FS1, and Fox Deportes. So, Orlando hosting Nashville tonight. I don't know if it's 7.09 or 7.25. I'm guessing, since it's 7 and 9, I would probably guess 7.09, 9.09 Eastern. We'll go into juice boxes and previews in hour number two. But... Nashville at Orlando, Dallas at Seattle. Tuesday is an off day. And then we get Columbus and Atlanta. And apparently the weather is going to be in the 40s. Because it was, I think, in the low 50s at kick in Cincinnati. But, yeah, it's supposed to be in the 40s. Supposed to be fairly sunny during the daytime, but supposed to be pretty cold. On Wednesday in Columbus for Atlanta and crew. So we'll go into all of that stuff in hour number two when it comes to uh, uh, early week whip around. Patent pending trademark coming sooner, hopefully, rather than later. We've got a lot of other stuff to talk about. We've got stupidity down here. We've got some sackings with some interesting stuff that are attached. Uh, the Athletic has the listing of the alleged favorites when it comes to the USWNT. Stupidity down here happened in France. And it was really stupid. And I wish I had like yakety sacks or something. But uh, in Ligue 1 yesterday, the league on match between Marseille and Lyon was called off on Sunday after an attack on Lyon's bus as the team made their way to the Stade Velodrome, and it left their head coach Fabio Grosso and his assistant Rafael Longo seriously injured in the face. There are pictures out there. Uh, if you're squeamish, don't go looking. Just know they exist. Fabio Grosso had to be treated for injuries to his forehead, in and around his eyes, and his cheekbone. Like I said, pictures are out there, and they're not pretty. Sky Italia footage showed damage to the bus windows, Grosso being led into the stadium by two assistants. Grosso was later pictured on a stretcher with a bloody face. John Texter told Prime Video, quote, he's Leon's uh, team president, he can't hold a conversation. He had shards of glass in his face. I'm very angry. Our players, our coach prepared for tonight. Fans wanted to see the game played. Lyon in a statement. Six buses of Olympic Lyonnais supporters also targeted. If in the past attacks of this type had already taken place, which Olympic Lyonnais has always regretted, this Sunday, 29 October, a new step towards the worst was taken. 
In fact, several secure windows were broken by heavy projectiles of unknown nature. These same projectiles penetrated the interior of the bus. Coach Fabio Grosso and his, and his assistant, Rafael Longo were directly hit and seriously injured in the face during the attack. Present with them on the bus, the players and staff were also deeply affected by the violence of this attack, which Olympic Lyonnais strongly condemns, end quote. Referee, quoted by French media, said that uh, with the injuries, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, with the injuries, considering the opinion of the club, which did not wish to start the match, and the established protocol decision was taken not to play the match. Marseille. And by the way, like I said, if you want to find, if you want to look for the photos, they're out there. Guardian has them. Marseille issued a, a statement condemning the attack, wishing Grosso well. Quote, due to a handful of mindless people, the game plan for this evening spoiled and deprived 65,000 supporters of attending a football match. The LFP, uh, French football's governing body, confirmed it's off, the match was off. It will now be up to the Competitions Commission to decide on the fate of this match by application of Article 544. Marseille hoped that the game could take place as quickly as possible under the best conditions at the Stade Velodrome. So, yeah, stupidity down here now moves to France. All I can say is that there better be CCTV footage. Find out who they are. Prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. And like I said, I know that I'm probably uh, yelling into the breeze here. Put them under the jail. Find out who they are. Put them under the jail. Make sure that they don't get to attend another match, regardless of any level, as long as they're on this planet. Maybe they can go to another planet. Don't care. Find them. Prosecute them. Fullest extent of the law. I'm over it. And when you have stuff like this happen, maybe, maybe just maybe, maybe if you didn't have fans at matches, I know that obviously, you know, like I said, this is pie in the sky stuff, but maybe if you didn't have a match or two where you had fans, then the fans that know and appreciate the game can import upon others who are thinking about doing this stupid ish in the first place, not to do this stupid stuff. You're hurting it for the rest of us. Don't do it. Doubt that would ever happen. But like I said, it's pie in the sky behavior for me. Bam says CCTV won't do ish. They won't be caught. Shooter says that uh, French League fans are wild. Saw a game earlier in the year, Division Two, and they had to stop it for a fire in the crowd. Doesn't remember the teams, but it was an opening match of the year in Ligue 2. We got a fire in the stands. Everybody out. Jeez. But, yeah, I think that, once again, this is a reminder to us that we all need to be good stewards for those around us if you see somebody doing something stupid just uh keep an eye on them keep an eye on the stupid people to make sure that stuff like what happened in france is minimized or lessened i don't think we'll ever be able to get rid of stupidity I would love for it to be a situation where we don't have stupidity down here as a segment. I'd love it. Is it going to happen? I doubt it. But every single time that we have something like this happen, you feel like you need to continue to to say something about it. Much like we do when we when we talk about officials state of play, that kind of thing. If you don't talk about it, 
then you're kind of being complicit and you're just kind of letting it be. You're just kind of accepting it for what it is. And I would much rather us talk it out, have it out into the ether and sit there and and put it out there to remind us constantly of what we need to do as stewards for the game, regardless of level, regardless of situation. Make sure that the game is there for all of us. And if people are being stupid, continue to remind people that being stupid is unacceptable. Not doing good by the game is unacceptable. Whether we're talking on the field, off the field, participation, officiating, whatever. Continue to be good stewards of the whole thing. So... Yeah, that, that, I guess that's your that's your soapbox for the day. Uh, yeah, and Bam, and you know uh, the Adam Johnson loss is it's tragic, absolutely tragic and terrible. And once again, much like we're talking about with Fabio Grosso, don't go looking for the video. Don't. Yeah, and, and shooter, I'm right there with you. I mean, they are for, you know, when uh, for hockey down here. Uh, I don't know how many of you are of a certain age, but might remember Clint Malarchuk. Uh, Clint Malarchuk was a goalie for the Buffalo Sabers, and he had his throat cut by an errant skate blade as he was uh, leaning down trying to stop a puck he leans forward uh scrum happens and he got he got brushed and it was it was pretty bad and malarchuk it took a while it took years uh but he did finally come back and he has suffered ptsd to this day there are some great features that are out there but yeah the the adam the adam johnson uh, accident. And there's a, then I read this morning that there's a police investigation going on. I'm like, come on. But it was just absolutely, absolutely horrific. But I, I think that we might be to the point where after the Malarchuk injury, you know, those, those pieces of plexiglass that you see below, uh, hockey, goalie masks that are attached to strings and you have that that piece of plexiglass that's there you might end up seeing that as an option for position players too or at least have something around the neck it would almost be like a turtleneck kind of a a sweater situation where you have the, the turtleneck work its way up to just below your chin so maybe there's something that can be done with, with plexiglass or something like that that you could have here. I know it's counterproductive and counterintuitive, and it probably, you know, weighs you down and things like that, but you might be to that point now after what happened with uh, with what happened with, uh, with uh, Adam Johnson this past weekend. Uh, yeah, Shooter, it's amazing. More guys haven't died. Most goalies use the neck guards. Crazy, though. Need to make it mandatory. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, it was, it was really bad, but don't go looking. Don't just don't, don't go looking for it. I don't know how many, I don't know how many more times I can say it and emphasize it and just don't, like I said, it's one thing to to look at stupidity in, in France because idiots are throwing things through bus windows, but yeah, the Adam don't just don't. I'll tell you, it's scary. It's bad. We know what happened, sadly. Just don't go look. Uh, Coming up on 10 o'clock, so that means uh, one thing. It's time to cut a promo. Hour number two, we'll talk about stuff in England. Uh, We'll talk about the women's national team. Uh, Wayne Rooney getting booed. Some folks are getting sacked in the lower divisions. There's plenty to talk about. Whatever's on your mind, we'll get into it. And we've also got uh, Monday whip around. Patent pending trademark coming sooner, hopefully, rather than later. So uh, since it is that time, 
where I've got to, apparently I've got to like set the music lower these days because of how apparently it muffles me out. So we'll see what happens here. Voter free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go. It's a lemonized service. QR code over my left shoulder for those of you watching on YouTube now, on Twitch and on the 280 character app. Voter free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go. It's a lemonized service. Deodorizing enclosed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. They've created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pet cigarettes, realtors, and property managers. Use the Lemonized service to eliminate bad odors so them accelerate their homes that much faster. The turnkey process, thank you, Ricky, for telling me what that means. Makes it easy to work with said realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment, we like that. That I know about. Offering a green way to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever. Different than Febreze or other masking agents that we have either above us in the cupboard or underneath the sink, because when we reach under the sink or above us in the cupboard, then you drag that masking agent out. There's a reason it's called a masking agent, because when you spray it in the air, all you're doing is masking the odor. You're not attacking the problem like our friends at Eliminize Service do with their proven scientific formula. Destroying odor down to the molecule, pricing very, very easy, one of two ways. Come up with a, pri a price that's affordable for you. Either by the cubic foot or parts per million, offering results in 24 hours or less. If you have any questions, frequently asked or otherwise, one place you need to go is the website. And it's right there. Mostly blocked out by the light that I have here in the studio. But uh, eliminize.com is the website. This is where I grab my pen. Eliminize.com, but after the .com, go slash Atlanta. So they know what part of the world that you are uh, addressing them from. So they can help you with your issues. Full homework assignment. E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com slash Atlanta. Eliminize.com slash Atlanta. Eliminize service. Proud sponsors of everything SDH here on a Monday. trying to get the fade in at the right point but there, there's no such thing as a clean fade when it comes to this music uh, yesterday uh jason and i got the chance to call the uh atlanta united u17s match against uh the uh u17s for uh nycfc and it was a fun one. It was it was a fun match. Uh, Rocket Rita Rita had a penalty in the 40th minute. Atlanta United was up uh, one nil, and then it was two goals in a handful of minutes for NYC. And NYCFC's U17s beat uh, Atlanta's uh, U17s by the score of two to one. You can catch that on the Atlanta United YouTube channel, by the way. But it was great to see some of the uh, some of the guys that we had the chance to see for uh, Atlanta United two and MLS Next Pro. Uh, Aiden Torres got the start yesterday, and Aiden, uh, when he stepped into the lineup for head coach Steve Cook, it was uh, you know no fear whatsoever from Aiden Torres at all, and he got more and more reps, more and more starts. I think he finished with. 10 starts last season for uh, Land United 2 in MLS Next Pro. So it was great to see Aiden yesterday. Ashton Gordon, one of the younger stars that, uh, you know, we're going to be keeping our eyes on going forward. Uh, got to see Ashton Gordon yesterday. Uh, Aowak and Toby got the start. Braden Dunham came off the bench. Owen Kutsis uh, got to see Owen put in some quality minutes. Landon Zuniga came in as a second-half sub and uh, stirred up some trouble on the left-hand side. Uh, and Callan Kalanji came in late and was uh, a change of pace coming in to go up against the tired legs of NYCFC. So that was was uh, good to see Kalen Kalanji there. Rocket Reader Reader, we mentioned Rocket and his activity getting the PK that made it 1 0. Uh, Julian Bretos got some uh, work yesterday. Dominic Chongqui got some. Uh, uh, action yesterday. Great to see him come as a as a wing back, and as we're used to seeing with Atlanta United, 
Uh, wingbacks getting engaged in the play, going all the way up the field. So I got to see uh, DCQ get some work yesterday. Cooper Sanchez uh, got some work. Uh, Jonathan Ransom was in net yesterday. Mason Peacock was in the in the middle uh, with the forwards. And uh, Caden Moore, got to see uh, Caden Moore, uh, you know, cause problems for uh, NYC yesterday in uh, the midfield. A- and yesterday also got to see Ethan Degney. And this will be someone to, to kind of keep your eye on. Degney is on the U15 roster. And he was a center back yesterday for uh, Steve Cavino. And Degney, <clears throat> probably 6'3 at the age of 15. Like I said, he's on the U15 roster. I think he just turned 15. Degney was creating problems and not afraid to engage in the play. He would storm right up the middle channel if the, the opportunity was there for him. But keep an eye on Ethan Degney. If you if you watch uh, Academy play with Atlanta United, like I said, right now at the U15, stepped in yesterday with the U17s and made it difficult for uh, NYCFC and their talent pool to try to uh, get something done uh, offensively. But for... Uh, NYCFC's U-17s getting to look at them yesterday. You could tell why there were some folks that uh, for the uh, you know, for the academy and the academy roster, why you got to see some of the the folks that you did for the uh, uh, on the MLS Next Pro side and. There were a couple of folks yesterday that, once again, as we get into the the season, once again, for MLS Next Pro, to kind of look at for uh, NYCFC and their squad. So uh, this and this is the other thing about looking at uh, academy academy football that when the season comes back in 2024 for MLS Next Pro you will have already had the chance to see these younger players who are right now back in their academies. But then once the season starts, you'll sit there and go, oh, okay, yeah, I remember seeing him go up against Atlanta United, uh, you know, in the, in the MLS next pro off season during the Academy season. And uh, Adam Boss, Adam Bassey was uh, Bassey also was, uh, one of the U-17s tall kid, too. And, I mean, it was really interesting to see Degney at 6'3", and Adam Bassey, who was probably 6'4". So, Bassey was the tall target that uh, NYCFC would use inside the six and for set pieces and such. And then in the second half, they had him, uh, striker, running up top. But, yeah, seeing Degney as a U-15 going up against Bassey as a U-17, that was an interesting matchup. Uh, you got to see uh, Maximo Carrizo, who, uh, if you remember your NYC FC2 and MLS Next Pro, Carrizo got some reps there, and you got to see the the talented player that he is yesterday. Uh, also, uh, I'm trying to see uh, Julian uh, Julian Lachey got, uh, uh, I think Julian Lachey got, it was either him or Christopher Arias who got credit for the second goal for NYC, but uh, Lachey came in in the second half. Uh, Johnny Shore is another guy who he's listed. When you you sit there and you quickly Google NYCFC U-17, Johnny Shore is listed as a midfielder. Johnny Shore yesterday for NYCFC's U-17s was all over the place. Started out in the attack, second half played a deeper role, caused problems wherever he was for Atlanta United too. Johnny Shore, another guy to keep an eye on. And so it was it was really interesting. A soft Sabi yesterday back on defense for NYCFC. But when you look at guys like Shore, guys like uh, Lachey, uh, Adam Bassey and Christopher Adias and Drew Bayera and Andres Becerra, those guys yesterday, they were – NYCFC at the boys' academy level, at the U-17s, Really, really interesting to see them uh, yesterday work their way through it. But, yeah, 
yesterday, 2-1. The U-17s in my CFC got the win over Atlanta United, uh, Atlanta United U-17s. Hopefully, like I said, Jason and I, it was fun for us to, to go up to the Children's Health Care of Atlanta training ground and uh, call that action yesterday. So uh, it was, it was like I said, it was a fun one, and hopefully we'll get to do more of that as the academy season goes along. Like I said, it's on the YouTube channel if you want to catch it and get caught up with folks. But uh, very, very cool yesterday. Very, very early morning at the Children's Health Care of Atlanta training ground. So that's why if you see me yawning, that's part of the reason why. And I will try my best to stifle yawns and hit the mute button because it was a very, very early Sunday after a very, very late Saturday with uh, Atlanta United. Uh, once again, news at the top of the show. You had a suspension. Uh, Luis Rubiales banned by FIFA from all football activity for three years. That's That was the news that broke before the show started this morning. And uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Went over the playoffs in hour number one. If there's anything that is uh, left on the table from your playoff activity and uh, viewing habits from the weekend, then uh, we'll go over that, obviously, in here in uh, hour number two. Uh, hour number two, we've got... Talking points from the weekend in the Premier League. And I think that if you're a Manchester City fan, you got to see what it's like to have Bernardo Silva and Rodri back. Manchester City taking care of Manchester United by the final of 3-0. So Manchester is blue for the foreseeable future. And... Obviously, there's a lot of folks, and I debate it, and I probably will play it tomorrow. Uh, you had Gary Neville and Jamie Carricker going at each other. And they were trying to discuss the current state of affairs at uh, Manchester United. It ain't pretty for a lot of folks right now. might be pretty for everybody who's not a Manchester United fan. Our Drew Dickinson. I'm sure when we do Prem and Proper this upcoming week, we'll discuss just how disgusted he is when it comes to the current state of affairs. But, uh, yeah, Neville and Carricker went at each other on Sky. Saying that sentence is pretty much all you need to know. It was basically a four-minute yelling match about the state of affairs with Manchester United. Uh, Alexis McAllister. 3-0, Liverpool over Nottingham Forest. They took care of business. No real surprise there. Brentford. Brentford knocked off Chelsea 2-0. I had Brian and Boom on my fantasy team. I didn't start him. Because it was at Stamford Bridge, and I'm thinking, you know, everything's going to be, you know, it's Chelsea's going to take care of business. I don't know if Brentford is going to have a, a striker in the situation to, to try to take care of business. Once again much like I am with all my other fantasy uh, my other fantasy teams, I got taken to school. There's a lot of stuff going on at Chelsea right now that they got to fix. Chelsea have lost eight Premier League home matches now in 2023. Most home league defeats in a calendar year since losing 10 in 1986. Of the 14 players Chelsea used, when Brentford got their first win at Stamford Bridge a year and a half ago in the Premier League. First ever Premier League win a year and a half ago, Brentford over Chelsea, at Chelsea. Of the 14 players Chelsea used that day, only Thiago Silva and Reese James, who came in as a sub, remain. Yeah. Mauricio Pochettino. And now folks are getting mad at Pochettino. I can't say I'm surprised because of the short-term memory that folks have and just the short-term churn we all have when it comes to needing instant gratification and instant results. But yes, Bully Clear Lake believe that throwing players at the problem is the solution. It's not. I don't know when they'll find that out. Uh, Spurs knocked out Crystal Palace 2-1. Spurs still top of the table. Once again, no real surprise there. Uh, apparently, there, there was a question that was posed to Ange Postacoglu. And, and I know that we've got to go into a deep dive with Jared at some point 
about Ange and why it is stylistically, and Bam, I know that you could help out here as well, when it comes to Ange Postacoglu and why it is, what, what it is stylistically and what they do to sit there and go, you know, we're going to make this as enjoyable as humanly possible, and here's how we do it. It was a post-game question that involved, you know, instead of a fortress, it seems like uh, Spurs Stadium is a nightclub because the players are having fun, fans are having fun, they're dancing all over. Postal Coglu didn't care. He's like, yeah, okay, it's fine, it's winning, it's fun. Bottom line, that's all that mattered to him. So, now Crystal Palace, larger issues. They went with uh, a lot of young kids. Roxaki, Ahamada, and Francia. Francia is a 19-year-old Brazilian, made his home debut. So, interesting, uh, what about Crystal Palace going forward? Uh, Arsenal knocked off Sheffield United 5-0. I'm still waiting. I've yet to see it about the future of Paul Heckingbottom and then Sheffield United. Will he be, will he be a manager who is sacked? Because right now, as we look at things in the Premier League, it ain't pretty. Sheffield United is at the bottom. Ten matches, they've given up 29 goals. They've only scored seven. They've lost nine of ten to start the season. And they are three points behind Burnley, who've lost four of five, four points behind Luton, who've lost three of four. Bournemouth snapped a four-game losing streak this past weekend, beating Burnley 2-1. And the larger issue there, and I may bring up, I, I may bring up this tomorrow, as well as a part of the discussion. There was apparently a six-minute video review of an offside call that could have tied the match at two. Jay Rodriguez scored late. And one angle to the eye, and because of where, because of how the vitality is structured, you can't be right there on the lines. You know, it's it's got to be a little off center, a little further down. And I think it was around the 18 was where this particular camera was. Rodriguez looks like he's leaning, and this one angle looks like he's offside. Then there was another angle that wasn't as conclusive, and it turned into a six-minute review, a six-minute review of was Jay Rodriguez offside, was he onside because he scored an equalizer. A six-minute review. Vincent Company, after the match, was less than happy about it. He said that uh, it, obviously that it was, you know, onside. It should have counted, and he was understandably pissed. My larger question has to do with the length of time with the review. You can't take six minutes to look for something because that means you are looking for something. The one angle from the eighteen looked like offside, and then obviously they used. X, Y axes and everything. And apparently it took him six minutes to get to the X, Y axes to sit there and say Jay Rodriguez was offside. But six minute review, you can't have that. Because if folks are mad enough about the idea of VAR to begin with, and you have a nut and you have so many talking heads overseas wanting to pull VAR off the table again and just go back to human error that uh, it's just, it was a frustrating situation all around. Vincent Company's still mad. And to me, it looked like it was offside. But six-minute review, you can't have that. You cannot have a six-minute review. Can't happen. Can't happen, can't happen, can't happen. We've got some uh, developing stuff out of France. We'll get back to stupidity down here in a bit. Yeah, uh, Dominic Irola, keeper hurts his ankle, down a goal after 11 minutes. Philip Billing, you get the win 2-1. Big win for uh, Irola, his first win in the Premier League. 
Uh, now, Wolves. Wolves in Newcastle. And our Maddie Cruz, I did not know this until yesterday. Our Maddie Cruz is a Newcastle supporter. Thank you, Alex. And you end up with um, Newcastle drawing Wolves at two. Pedro Neto was carried from the field after 77 minutes with a hamstring problem. Gary O'Neill reported after the match Neto was moving around in the dressing room. Hope that the player's absence will not be prolonged. Both uh, uh, Wang Hee Chan and Mateus Cunha might have to step in if Neto's absence is going to be prolonged. That is not going to help out the Wolves as they try and stay afloat. Uh, Everton, big win over West Ham as Everton continues to rack up points, especially if it gets to the point to where they're going to have a 12-point deduction for violating FFP down the line. They would not be as far off the table with that deduction whenever it comes. They'd be three points behind Sheffield United. They're 10 points right now, and they're ahead of Nottingham Forest on goal difference. Big win for them in the Premier League. Villa beat Luton Town 3-1, like I said at the beginning of the season. Uh, I had Luton Town as one of my three clubs going back down after a year. It's great to see them up but they're lacking in firepower. And right now, Aston Villa, they're in European football places. And they're also only a win out of second. They're at 22 points in fifth place. 22 points, fifth place right now for Aston Villa. Unbeaten in their last five. Four wins in their last five. They've won two in a row. 7-1-2, and two, great start for Villa so far this season. Also, Brighton and Fulham, a 1-1 draw. Pascal Gross, interesting stat from our friends here at The Guardian. Pascal Gross joined Brighton in 2017 from Ingolstadt for £3 million. 32 league goals at the age of 32 now. And he finally has made his Germany debut at the age of 32. 36 assists in the top flight in his 200th Premier League appearance on Sunday. And we believe here in the Church of Deserby. And with what we're seeing from Brighton, Brighton once again, 17 points. European competition, you know, they've got to figure out how to navigate that for the first time ever. 17 points, 10 matches. They are below Newcastle on goal difference. But Brighton's also ahead of Manchester United, who's at 15 points. So Brighton about where we figured they would be having to navigate European competition in addition to everything else. So that's where we are with the the Premier League. And Bam, you are absolutely correct. As long as you get results on the pitch, who cares what happens in the locker room? And I mean, this was out on the field. The, The videos out there, you got folks with phones shooting what's going on on the field. End of the match is Spurs win. Players literally are are dancing with the fans. Fans are doing their their bit, you know, where they're going from side to side and they're playing one step beyond or whatever. And uh, the, the players are going right there with them. But the bottom line is, if you're having fun, who cares what you do? At least no one should care that uh, you're having fun. It's a fortress. Well, yeah, and so we're dancing when we win, too. Big deal. Um. So, absolutely. Yes, Spurs need all the enjoyment they need. Exactly. Uh, Oh, here's your your stupidity down here update. And uh, I'll go ahead and and lay this out this way, provided I can find it. From our friends at the uh, Agence France Press, French police have detained nine people. Like I said, this is from our friends at the AP as of a couple of minutes ago. French police have detained nine people searching for other suspects after the attack on the bus. And this is according to the interior minister in France. Interior minister Gerald Darmanet said on BFM television, five police officers were also injured in the attack Sunday night. 
Shame and disgust was the headline on Lakeep's front page with a picture of Grosso's bloody face. Great. However, this is still uh, the AP. However, it's unlikely the attack will lead to disciplinary sanctions against the nine-time French champ since it took place outside the Velodrome Stadium. Responsibility lies with the public authorities and not with the club. The case has been taken over by a French league committee in charge of scheduling competitions and not by the discipline commission. Hit on the way to the velodrome, shattering windows. Grosso suffered a deep cut above his left eye, requiring stitches at a large bandage wrapped around his head. Attack widely commented on in media outside France comes at a very bad time for the French league amid negotiations for the sale of their TV rights abroad. Earlier this month, the auction for the domestic broadcast rights for the 2024 to 2029 period. I did not know this. The uh, negotiating period was canceled after the league failed to attract bids meeting the minimum price set. Johnny Infantino said on Instagram, quote, there's absolutely no place for violence in soccer on or off the pitch and called on the competent authorities to ensure that the appropriate measures are taken. Infantino continues. Without exception, in soccer, all players, coaches, and fans must be safe to enjoy our sport. He added a picture of Grosso with a bandage on his face with the message, Forza Fabio. Sports Minister Emilia Ude Castera called for a global response and said the French League, the teams, and fan groups should take all take responsibility. Speaking Monday on France 2 television, she called for tougher restrictions on troublemakers. She and Darmanat defended police protection for the Lyon team, even though the measures weren't enough to prevent the attack. Marseille President Pablo Longoria said the attack was unacceptable and the club wished Grosso a speedy recovery. We mentioned the quote from the club. Incidents also took place in the seating area at Marseille Stadium before the game was canceled. Some Lyon fans making racist gestures directed at the home supporters. Lyon said in a statement Monday it has requested surveillance videos to identify them and keep them away from the stands. Atmosphere has long been tense between the teams, notably since fans from Marseille and Lyon fought in a violent brawl 10 years ago. I didn't know this. That left 17 injured. Both clubs have been under pressure lately. Marseille, Marseille is still showing poor form with one win, three losses in their last four league matches. Lyon is the only team still winless in the league. So there's that. So you can't find you can't find anybody to give you the minimum low bid for your new TV deal which means it's probably going to get picked up for pennies on the dollar by somebody. And now you've got fans throwing stuff at buses, and it's apparently these two clubs have a history of throwing stuff at each other. To uh, add to it all, right now, PSG isn't even leading the league. PSG is a point behind Nice. Nice is on top. Monaco's a point behind PSG. Yep, Lyon, one of four teams that has not completed match week 10 yet. You end up with, uh, right now, we mentioned Lyon. Lyon is in such a bad place. No wins, three points, three draws, six losses. Nine matches, they've given up 18 goals. Lost three of four. And they are seven points adrift right now out of the relegation zone. To get out of the relegation zone. Lyon is at 10 points. Lyon is at three. Clermont Foot actually has a win this year. Everybody else has two or more. So, yeah, PSG, this is how upside down the, the league is right now. Lyon, who we always see in European theater, we always see in European competitions. They don't have a win. They've got three draws. They're dead blank and last. PSG's not even on top right now. 
with uh, Mbappe because of the injuries uh, of others. But yeah, PSG right now, they're not even on top of the league. So you got that. That's how upside down the upside down is right now in France. And Bam says, speaking of music after the game, Denver playing shake it off after beating Kansas City is amazing. Denver's got to be careful. Denver's got to be careful. Because the next time that Denver plays Kansas City, Kansas City is going to find a point and make a point to sit there and go, you know, what you did last time, we remember. We remember what happened. Next time that Kansas City plays Denver, take the over. Next time Denver plays Kansas City, take the points. (laughs) Bam actually is owning up to being a Denver Broncos fan. Didn't think he'd beat him. I have Cortland Sutton on my fantasy team, and that was probably a mistake. By the way, my fantasy team is just a mess. I started out the season with two of my top stars on IR. This past week, I did okay. But the thing is, uh, I don't know if I don't know if you remember this. The thing about my my fantasy league is this. You know, standard fantasy leagues, you have, you know, wins and losses. And we're, we're in a 12-team league. And what we decided to do a couple of years ago is, <laughs> yeah, Rich, uh, Shooter was in our number one, Rich. And Shooter, you can go back in the Twitch pitch and read, but Shooter went nuts, understandably so. And I went off on Pierre-Luc Lozier. I know that shocked you. But now my fantasy team, yeah, we, we our league decided to do something different to, to add, some, add some excitement to wins and losses where if your club, if your team scores over the league scoring median, 12 teams, you take the average number of points scored, If your team scores more than the league average, you get an extra win. But if you don't, you get an extra loss. So literally every week, you could either go 2-0 and or 0-2. And And for me, who started out with uh, a quarterback and a wide receiver on injured reserve, you could probably guess who those are. I've started out at the bottom of the pool. And and have tried to sit there and, and dig my way out of it. I mean, my roster, I've had to pull quarterbacks from places I wouldn't have imagined. I've had to find running backs from teams I wouldn't have imagined had running backs that needed to be picked up. And I'm still awful. And because I'm still awful and I'm not scoring points, I'm basically losing twice every week. So right now, I'm 11th in, an, in a 12-team league. That's how bad it is for me right now in this league. And it's right over there, over by the television. Two years ago, I won my fantasy league. I won my fantasy football league two years ago, and the trophy is right over there by the large television. I have not been the same since. I traded away Alvin Kamara for Najee Harris because I needed points early on because of the uh, injuries and the folks I I had on IR. And Najee Harris has done nothing for me because everybody's keying on Najee Harris because of the quarterbacking situation in Pittsburgh. So I traded away Alvin Kamara because Kamara was going to be out for the four weeks because of the suspension, because of what he did last year at uh, Pro Bowl weekend. So I was like, okay, I don't have Alvin Kamara for the first four weeks. I need running help. And so I traded for Najee Harris. That didn't go out so well. Alvin Kamara really hadn't done a whole heck of a lot either. I should have picked up Taysom Hill, and I waited too late. But right now, that's, uh, yeah, so my fantasy my fantasy league is a mess. Not a surprise, but my fantasy league is a mess. And that's the the kind of stuff that we're staring at here 
uh, with me today on a Monday. Uh, other news in and around what's going on. Uh, and we mentioned the U.S. Uh, WNT situation where it looks like that, uh, and like I said, it appears that uh, we have some finalists when it comes to the, the U.S. WNT and their coaching situation. They defeated Columbia in a friendly yesterday. And uh, Mia Fischel and uh, Jaden Shaw in a 3-0 win. Uh, Fischel opened the scoring with a goal in the 56th. Haran scored in the 62nd. Jaden Shaw scored in the 83rd. The U.S. took 20 shots compared to Columbia's three. Seven shots on target against Columbia's two. Next set of friendlies is against China in early December. We'll go over the, the, uh, the numbers from our friends at Soccer America. And the U.S. has outlined their process for figuring out who their coach is and to have them in place by December. So we'll keep an eye on that. But it looks like there are a couple of names that are out there for the uh, the U.S. WNT gig. And so we'll see who's who's on the mind of the... uh, of the women's national team uh, coming up in short order. Uh, Since we are on the numbers yesterday, the friendlies ratings, and obviously they're going to be somewhat stilted because of a a 3-0 win. In front of a crowd of 16-202. Casey Murphy didn't have a whole lot to do. Two saves in the opening moments of the second half. She, <laughs> they gave her a five. Theodore Lloyd Hughes. Uh, you know, I would love to know. Soccer America, and this is where we get our ratings, and it's a talking point. Like I said, when Bart comes on on Wednesday, we'll discuss this in more in depth. I'd love to know wh- what their scale is. Didn't have a whole lot to do. Made two saves. Ah, you got a five. Yeah, you didn't have a whole lot to do. Eh, you got a five. Defenders, Emily Fox is six. Alana Cook, no. McGirma, Crystal Dunn each got fives. Another under-engaged day for USA's back line. Fox impressed. Got the assist for Haran's goal. Girma and Cook went the full 90. Didn't put a foot wrong for the most part, but you gave them fives. Crystal Dunn made Alexa Barr into a non-factor. And by the way, you know, when you uh when you when you've got uh uh Alexa Barr over at the uh, University of South Carolina out of Buford High School, we need to catch up with uh, Alexa. We need to catch up with uh uh, Ms. Calzada out at Texas A&M, too. There's a lot of high school talent that is in the college game right now. So we'll catch. We'll see if we can find a way to catch up with Alexa Barr and uh, with uh, uh, Brittany Calzada out at A&M. But, uh, yeah, so basically you don't take a step wrong, you get a five. You don't take a step wrong, you get a six. Crystal Dunn made Alexa Barr into a non-factor. Got a five. Savannah DeMello in the midfield only changed to Twyla Kilgore's midfield, repaid, uh, being the brightest spark. Numerous chances, high press, mostly unassuming afternoon for Emily Sonnet, who got a five. So DeMello, you say all these things about DeMello in two sentences that take up five lines and you only give her a six. Sonnet didn't need to shield the back line much at all, so she gets a five. Starting moment provided the cross for Fischel's opening goal. Haran, biggest box threat, most frustrating weapon, consistently targeted in the air. Couldn't find her poise in the box to make a large number of chances count. However, the volley for the second goal was a thing of beauty, so we'll give her a six. Okay, forwards. 
Even when the USA account is uh, attack is struggling, you can count on Trinity Rodman holding up her end of the deal. Always looking to make something happen. Expert presser of the ball. Again, unlucky not to get an assist with plenty of fine crosses and dribbles. Not capitalized on Alex Morgan's now gone 11 matches without scoring a goal for her country. Alex Morgan got a four. Sophia Smith got a four. Trinity Rodman got a six. Sophia Smith. So Sophia Smith gets a four, working her way back from a knee injury. Kept her on the sidelines. Made very little impact during her 45 minutes. You get a four. Alex Morgan, you don't score, you get a four. Trinity Rodman gets a six. And so then Fischel and and Shaw score. Say that ten times fast. Fischel and Shaw score. They get sevens in limited duty. Sam Coffey a five. Sofia Huerta a five. Alyssa Thompson a six. Ashley Sanchez came in, got a cup of coffee, and got a, a no rating. And so, trivia from our friends at Soccer America. Alyssa Thompson assisted Jaden Shaw. First-time teenagers had combined for a USWNT goal since at least 2001 when Opta started tracking the data. Jen Cooper then updated that, citing the July 7, 2004 win over Italy when 19-year-old Allie Wagner assisted 19-year-old Caroline Putz. After four matches, the WNT is yet to concede a goal under Twyla Kilgore. Last time, the team conceded a goal 613 minutes ago. 1-1 draw against the Netherlands in the World Cup group stage. Next up, USA-China, December 2nd in Fort Lauderdale, December 5th in Frisco, Texas. Here's your stats. Shots 20 to 3, 7 2 on target, four saves for Columbia, two for the U.S., three corners to one, 47 fouls? 47 fouls called? Are you serious? 47 fouls. I didn't even know that was possible. 47 fouls called in USA and Columbia. Five offside for US, two for Columbia, possession 57-43. So December 2 in Fort Lauderdale, December 5 in Frisco, Texas, USA and China, doubleheader. David's done with Alex Morgan. After her play and arguing the yellow, I think I'm fully done with Morgan, brought very little the past 12 months. And once again, David, remind me, or uh, when Bart comes in 1030 Wednesday morning, remind me about that. We've got our referee assignment, by the way, for uh, crew and uh, Atlanta United. Looks like it's Lucas Zapala in the middle. AR is Adam Winkowski and Jason White. Your fourth is Philip Dujic. Your VAR is Soren Stoichka. And your AVAR is TJ Zablocki, courtesy of uh, Doug Robertson of the AJC. So David's done with Alex Morgan, brought very little the past 12 months. David, like I said, when Bart comes in on Wednesday, bring this back up again. Uh, all right, let's get into a weekend whip around. Or weekend. It's not even the weekend. It is Monday whip around, John. Patent pending, trademark coming sooner, hopefully, rather than later with the two matches that we have today. One at 7, one at 9, and uh, it's probably 7.09 and 9.09 because of TV, and I have yet to see anything weird about Orlando, Nashville, and Seattle, and Dallas doing the 9.25 routine where we had the super hyper mega extra supersized pregame show from the uh, over-the-air rights holder. I've yet to see anything in that regard, but let me double check my sources here. Uh, so, uh, friend of the network, Lucas Panzica, 
and he has nothing posted. Nothing posted about a start time. So we'll see. Uh, my guess is right now, uh, uh, when it comes to players, And we'll see what happens there. So no word from Lucas Panzica about a nine to a nine a seven twenty five start. Uh, nothing from Nico or Dallas about a nine twenty five start. So we'll see what happens here. Orlando Nashville. In our uh, in our juice boxes, we got to get into the juice boxes. So we'll see what actually Halloween candy. What am I saying? It's Halloween candy until we get past Halloween. So your your favorite Halloween candy, whether it's Reese's or what have you. Uh, all right. So right now, Orlando City is even money plus a hundred. Your ninety minute draws a plus two fifty four. I don't quite see it getting there. And Nashville is a plus 265 to win in 90 minutes. So as we look at that, it's on the free side of Apple TV. It's on FS1, and it is on Fox Deportes. Fun facts. This will be the third straight year Orlando City and Nashville meet in a knockout round. Nashville eliminated Orlando with a 3-1 home win in the first round of the 2021 MLS Cup playoffs before uh, Orlando City beat Nashville on penalties after a 1-1 draw in Orlando in the quarterfinals of the 2022 U.S. Open Cup. Remember, that's been on the run with uh, Orlando getting all those home matches in a row. Orlando City defeated Nashville 1-0 on October 4th to end an eight-match winless run against them in all comps, drawing five, including a penalty shootout win and losing three. Orlando's only previous win over Nashville was a 3-1 home win in the first ever meeting between the teams in August of 2020. Orlando City set up club, set club records for points with 63, wins with 18, fewest losses in a full season with 7, tied the club record for goals with 55 in 2023. Lions enter the playoffs as the informed team in Major League Soccer having collected a league high 26 points, eight wins, two draws, and a loss since returning from the uh, League's Cup break. Nashville's made the playoffs in each of its first four MLS seasons, becoming the third expansion team to do so after Seattle, who made it in their first 13, and Chicago, who was made it in their first six. Nashville's collected just 11 points since returning from the League's Cup break, winning two, drawing five, and losing three. Fewest of any playoff team in that time. Duncan McGuire has contributed to at least one goal in each of his last five MLS appearances, five goals and an assist. The Orlando City Club record for consecutive MLS matches, including playoffs with a goal contribution, is six done twice, most recently done by Daryl DK in 2021. Hani Mukhtar has recorded 11 goal contributions, six goals, five assists in nine career MLS matches against Orlando City, including the playoffs. Mukhtar has contributed to at least one goal in each of his first eight matches against Orlando before Nashville was shut out 1-0 when the sides met back on October the 4th. So looking at this one, I legitimately, I do not know how you're you're going to uh if you pin if you pin honey mukhtar in which i think orlando does i don't know if nashville has an alternative i really don't so your uh, availability report for nashville nick depew is out questionable both lucas mcnaughton and jacob schaffelberg all three are listed as lower body injuries i feel like we're talking stanley cup playoff stuff here when it comes to Schaffelberg, that is the one to me that has the most red flare attached to it. Because if Schaffelberg doesn't come off the bench late, 
cause trouble like he's been doing in the past. I don't know how Nashville, if they're having to come back from a deficit, if you're missing uh, Schaffelberg on the left-hand side, I don't know what you can do to combat that. I don't know who else steps into that idea on the left-hand side late in the match to be uh, you know, that instigator offensively. So if you don't have Schaffelberg, that to me is a, a big red flag waving in the air. So we'll see what happens there. I've got to go with Orlando here. I just think that Orlando's defense and, and being at home, for me, that is something that you're uh, you're looking at here. It's going to be a tall order for Nashville. I think that Nashville can pin in uh, Honey Mukhtar, and I just don't see any alternatives offensively for, for Mukhtar. I think that Nashville's going to try to muck this game up. I think that uh, if they can spring – uh, if they can spring Mukhtar in a situation where you are uh, you get a transition opportunity, that's the only way that they're going to be able to get things done. I don't know if Orlando's going to allow that. So I've got to go Orlando here in game one of this series. Availability report for Orlando City. Fabian Loyola with a left arm injury is out. Jack Lynn with a left thigh injury is out. Jack Lynn, we know him from our time in MLS next pro. So we'll see what happens. Uh, he would have, to me, he would have been a bench option. I don't know how that affects the bench for uh, Oscar Pereja. And this is an Orlando city team that has, it is entirely different than ones we've seen in the past. Traditionally with Oscar Pereja, it has been run out and get a boatload of points and then uh, kind of fade your way into the postseason. This is not that team that we're seeing from Orlando. So uh, I've got to go Nashville here, and we will effort Lucas Panzica for a postmortem in the morning out of the blocks at uh, 9.05. Also on the board for your 9 o'clock match, it is Seattle and Dallas. Juice box, sorry, not juice boxes, Reese's, or your favorite Halloween candy. Uh, if you have any of your favorite Halloween candy, or maybe if you just want to have Halloween candy that you that isn't your favorite, that you feel like you should uh, get rid of so you have room in the fridge. Seattle at home, a minus 149. 90-minute draws a plus 272. Dallas to win is a plus 430. Interesting. Once again, no word on whether or not. I think this is going to be the 909 I don't think it's going to be a 925 Eastern time. Fun facts. This will be the sixth time Seattle and Dallas have met in the playoffs all since 2014. Sounders have advanced in four of the previous five, including the last three in a row. The only time FC Dallas was able to knock Seattle out was in the 2015 conference semis. Including playoffs, Seattle's unbeaten in 17 straight home MLS matches against FC Dallas, winning 13 of them, by the way. Drawing four, dating back to 2012. Only three teams have longer home unbeaten runs against a single opponent in Major League Soccer history, including playoffs. Shooters New England, 20 straight from 02 to 13 against New York. I'm guessing that's NYC. Since it doesn't say Red Bulls. RSL has 18 straight from 07 to 19 versus Colorado, and San Jose has 18 straight in an unbeaten run from 2001 to 2016 against Kansas City. Sounders enter the playoffs on a nine-match unbeaten run, winning four and drawing five, tied with FC Dallas for the longest active streak in Major League Soccer. Seattle's longest unbeaten run in all comps since going 13 straight without defeat to open the 2021 season. FC Dallas unbeaten in four straightaway matches in all comps, winning two and drawing two, including winning 4-1 at the Galaxy on decision day. Dallas has not won consecutive away matches in all comps in over five years since a three-match run in May and June of 2018. Raul Rui Diaz. Nine goals, six assists, and 11 career playoff matches, including scoring a goal and recording two assists against FC Dallas in 2019. Rui Diaz has averaged 1.31 goal contributions per 90 minutes in the postseason. That's goals plus assists. Best of any player to play 500 or more playoff minutes in MLS history. FC Dallas has lost only one match in all comps since the beginning of League's Cup. 
five wins, nine draws. Fewest defeats of any MLS team in that time. Dallas unbeaten in nine straight. Last recorded a double-digit unbeaten run in all comps in 2014 when it was 14 straight. I think it's going to be a tall order for them going to Seattle. I could see, I could see this going to, I could see this going to penalties. I still think Seattle should take care of business, though. Though I think my my gut tells me Seattle takes care of business. Probably a one-goal game. Maybe take the over if you're looking at this one. So if you have any spare Halloween candy in the freezer or anything like that, look at your total. Uh, starting at two and a half, it's a plus one twelve. Three and a half is a plus two ninety. So if you think it's going to be two one, it's a plus one twelve. Three and a half is a plus two ninety. Three is a plus two oh six. Over under of three is a plus two oh six. Three and a half is a plus two ninety. I'll take the small. I'll take the small uh, advantage at plus two and a half. The three. I don't know. Don't know about that. I could see the two and a half. Like I said, I could see it being two one. That plus three is it plus two oh six. Two two and a half seems like an easy play. Three three and a half might be a little too much. I could see three. I could see two and a half. I don't see three and a half. So we'll keep an eye there. And obviously we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk to. Uh, Nico Moreno on Thursday and get his thoughts about game one in this series. Bam doing the public service announcement, by the way. If you do not, if you have not joined the Discord, join the Discord. I'll leave that up for the remainder of the show so you guys can write things down or chop it up and do a cut and paste and join the Discord and join the conversations that are there for uh, everyone every single time uh, when it comes to all of the activity that we have here in uh, in SDH on a daily basis. On a daily basis, people. Oh, the uh, I mentioned the short list for the women's national team. Once again, we'll get Bart's thoughts on this. Narrowed their search to a short list headed by three candidates. Australia head coach, former WNT assistant Tony Gustafson, Juve women's head coach Joe Montemuro, and Rain head coach Laura Harvey. It's from Meg Linehan over at The Athletic. Other candidates may still be on the Federation shortlist. Sources briefed on the search indicated those are the three names considered at the top of the list. Two sources told Linehan, Gustafson is unlikely to relocate to the U.S. for the role, which could affect his chances of being offered the job. Naturally, U.S. soccer is not going to comment. And uh, Vladko Andonofsky, remember, Vladko is now the head coach of the Kansas City Current. Moving into a new building, new barn, that's a pretty good hire. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Kansas City does now with Vlatko in charge as they wander into their new building. So sticking point, according to Lenihan, appears to be the Federation's desire to have a coach take a full-time approach to the role, though there is no formal requirement for a head coach to live in Chicago or south of 285 in coming years. Uh, largely avoided commenting on being linked to the U.S. job, meaning Gustafson. Uh, though he expressed the desire to stay with Australia after the World Cup, assuming the Fed increases investment in the team. So Montemuro may be U.S. soccer's next option. Uh, Australian manager got his start coaching the men's game, shifted to coaching women in his home country, Melbourne Victory, Melbourne City in the W League. Bam would know a lot about this before leaving for Arsenal in 2017. Arsenal won the women's Super League title in 1819. Appointed head coach of Juve, won the domestic treble in his first year. Club currently second in Serie A. Five wins out of the blocks. They're behind Roma in goal difference. So those are the three right now that are tied to it, according to Meg Linehan. I still want Randy Waldron. Tony Gustafson, head coach of Australia, Juve women's head coach Joe Montemuro, and OL Reign head coach Laura Harvey. So we'll keep an eye on that going forward. Seattle and Dallas, I, I still think that Seattle gets this done. I could take the total at two and a half, and I'm sure that I could find some candy corn or something like that in the back of the uh, in the back of the fridge to uh, go the other way and go 90 minute draw. So uh, first impulse is to sit there and go Seattle. Second impulse 
if I'm going up against the the rest of the table, is to pull some Halloween candy out of the the uh, the back of the fridge and go 90 minute draw. So that's uh, like I said, that that's my way of, of playing against the table in a situation like this. Uh, gossip rumor and innuendo and what to watch before we go. And once again, thanks to uh, all of you for hanging out with us on a Monday and getting ready for playoffs, playoffs, and playoffs practically every day of the week, except for tomorrow. Uh, Roma considering an offer or considering offering Tammy Abraham to Chelsea in a swap deal for Romelo Lukaku, who's on loan. Real Madrid plan to sign PSG's Kylian Mbappe and Manchester United, Manchester City's Erling Holland. That's from our friends at Il Chiringuito. Sure. What the hell? Yeah, why not? Arsenal, Manchester United, Manchester City interested in Crystal Palace is Mark Gahey. Arsenal prepared to sell Aaron Ramsdale next summer. Real Sociedad and defender Robin Lenormand being monitored by Manchester United and Real Madrid. Arsenal may reassess a January move over Pedro Neto because of concerns over his fitness. Yes, a hamstring injury will do that. Real Madrid, Arsenal, and Chelsea want Shamrock Rovers' 17-year-old attacking midfielder Naj Razi, who is a Republic of Ireland youth international. Fluminense, 22-year-old midfielder Andre Trindad rejected a summer move amid interest from Liverpool and Arsenal. Liverpool considering a move for Bayern Munich's 20-year-old forward Jamal Musiala who's unhappy with his playing time. Villa preparing to open contract talks with Douglas Luiz, who is admired by Arsenal. Manchester United are interested in Nice's defender Jean-Claire Todibo, according to Fabrizio Romano. Arsenal and Spurs want Ivan Toney, but are not willing to meet Brentford's 61 million pound asking price. That will be a story here in December and January. How patient will Brentford be? How impatient will others be? If Brentford hang on and bring Ivan Tony back in in the January window and get him for the stretch run and they've hung on to him, they could charge up the table. Looking forward to seeing what evolves from there. And Jesse Lingard searching for a new club because of Steven Gerrard's all etifak do not have room for him in their squad. So Jesse Lingard went out, worked out for uh, Steven Gerrard's Al Etifak, and they don't have room for him. So it's going to be, uh, it will be intriguing to see where Lingard goes. Does he go back to Nottingham Forest, maybe? We'll see what happens there. Uh, what to watch? Ballon d'Or ceremony is at 345, by the way, in Paris. Ceremonies begin 345 Eastern. Red carpet coverage begins at 2. Golasso Network providing additional coverage and analysis of the Ballon d'Or throughout the day. Studio programming. Awards include men's and women's Ballon's d'Or. BN and BN and Espanol have a Turkish Super League at 1 o'clock. Besiktas and Gaziantep. And uh, if you do not have BN, you can go to Fanatis, fntz.co slash soccer down here, and you can get everything that you would need when it comes to uh, streaming a lot of stuff. You get the BNs, you get the Libertadores, you get the Sudamericana, you get TAC, you get CDO, you get For the Fans, you get Nuestra Tele. All of that. Goal TV. Go to Fanatis. I blame Jason. He got me hooked. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. Orlando City, Nashville, 7. Seattle FC, Dallas on the free side of Apple TV, and they're on FS1. ESPN Deportes, La Liga, Granada, Villarreal is at 4. Goal TV. Portuguese Primeiro's at 4.15, Boa Vista and Sporting. I wonder if Boa Vista's paying anybody. Ecuadorian Primeiro's at 8, Nacional and Guayaquil City. ESPN Plus, Coventry City, West Brom is at 4. Granada Villarreal is at 4. The Big 12 Tournament, the Sun Belt, the America East. Uh, those are on, on the women's side on ESPN Plus starting at 10.30 this morning with Texas and West Virginia. That's late first half going through uh, 9 o'clock tonight with TCU and UCF. Men's side has two matches at 2 and at 6. Paramount Plus, busy day. Serie A, two matches. Empoli, Atalanta, 130. Lazio, Fiorentina, 345. Argentine, Primera starts at 3, ends at 815. 
Tejeras Cordoba, Bonfield is at three. Lanus is at 5.30. San Lorenzo is at six. Huracan Baraka Central is at eight. Platense and Newell's is at 8.15. Women's Gold Cup qualifying also on Paramount Plus at three, at six, at eight, and at 9.30. And once again, remember Ballon d'Or. Uh, red carpet coverage starts at two. Ceremonies begin at 3.45 on uh, Golasso Network. Uh, also, you've got a couple of uh, sackings and some booing going on in uh, the lower divisions. Uh, Wayne Rooney's already being booed at Birmingham City because of a, a lack of uh, goal-scoring prowess by his club at the moment. And in the championship currently, Birmingham City, who are hosting Ipswich on the weekend, Birmingham City right now, they are smack dab middle of the table. They're in 14th. 18 points, minus one in goal difference. They've scored more a, more goals in Bristol City. So they're basically a win out of ninth and five points out of the promotion playoff. And people are booing. Of course you are. Uh, also on the board, uh, speaking of Bristol City, Nigel Pearson was sacked after uh, losing it to Cardiff. Club chairman says, now is the time to make a change. 15th in the table, once again. They're 15th in the table. They're behind Birmingham City on goals scored. Five points out of the promotion playoff, and you sack uh, Nigel Pearson after you lose to Cardiff, losing 2-0. First team coach Jason Yule, head of medical performance Dave Rennie have also left the club. Curtis Fleming taking interim charge, assisted by Ali Hines and Khalifa Cisse. Uh, Gareth Ainsworth sacked by QPR after their sixth straight defeat in the championship. And uh, where is QPR? QPR is in the relegation zone. Sheffield Wednesday, who panicked and apparently hired a coach who I think is 34, first ever gig. Uh, they are last. QPR is next to last. They've lost five in a row. They are 2-2 and 10. They've only scored 10 goals in 14 matches. They've given up 26. Rotherham, they're the only three teams in the championship that have scored less than double digits so far through 13 or 14 matches. Neil Warnick, at the age of 74, is being rumored to come back to manage, I guess, for the rest of this season to try to see if he can get QPR out of the relegation zone. So we'll see what happens there. So tonight, double header when it comes to uh, MLS playoffs. We'll talk about all that tomorrow. Join the Discord. Thank you, Bam. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us on a Monday as we went through a very, very busy weekend. We got a lot of notes. Got a lot of stuff to talk about, and we'll talk about it even more tomorrow. So once again, thanks to all of you guys for hanging out with us. And we will do it all over again tomorrow morning, 9.05. Once again, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Our friends at Soccer in the Streets are on to talk footy ball, and we're going to effort Lucas Panzica to come on out of the blocks at 9.05 to talk about the Nashville match, see what the voice of Nashville SC has to say about all of that. Game one of three tonight, 7 o'clock, on the networks that carry the MLS playoffs. It is FS1, Fox Deportes, and Apple TV. Everything's on the free side. Go watch Afghanistan and Sri Lanka in the crickets. Most certainly we will do that if we are able. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. We'll be back at it again, 9.05 tomorrow morning. Mucha pati, I'll play it safe. And since it's the end of the show, it means we get to do this. We'll do it again tomorrow morning because that's what we do here at uh, SDH. Here's your uh, end of the show, as promised.